Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Caroline McGuire. I'm a librarian here at the Free Library. I work in the Business Science and Industry Department, and we're the one hosting the event tonight. Uh, before I uh, introduce Dr. Chan, I just want to let you know that uh, we have some upcoming programs that we're uh, having in the next month or so. We've got some flyers in the back. We have one on like database training, um, intellectual property, and like social media. So feel free to take some of the uh, flyers back there. I also want to let you know we have this flyer, which kind of tells you all the resources that the Business Science and Industry Department offers and what we can do to help you in your small business. So let's get started before. Uh, let's see, Dr. Chan, uh, he advises U.S. firms um, selling American-made products to services in Asia. He has 29 years of experience running a consulting practice serving a client list of more than 100 U.S. firms. He's the author of the book Spare Room Tycoon, which we have in the back of the room there. And he has a BA degree from Hong Kong, a master's degree from the University of Chicago, and a PhD from the University of Michigan. He founded his consultancy in 1983. Uh, let's see, James Chan who was China manager and international promotion manager at Academic Press, which is a subsidiary of HBJ, a Fortune 500 publishing company in New York. He's a naturalized citizen since 1987, and he lives and works in Center City. He's got um, his website, which is www.asiamarketingmanagement.com, and you can go there to read his profile. Ladies and gentlemen, James Chan. Thank you, Caroline. Can you hear me here? Is my voice clear? Uh, I want to record this because there are people who cannot make it tonight, and they have asked me, if I can somehow have a summary of our talk. So uh, I'll see if this very simple down-to-earth flip video uh, is able to do the trick. And what I plan to do is uh, talk about consulting, the basics of consulting, hopefully in less than 40 minutes. And, um, and after that, uh, I will uh, uh, talk with you and answer whatever questions you have. Uh, um, in order for me to uh, uh, talk about consulting in a way that uh, doesn't make me feel like I'm a monkey jumping all over the map, because you know uh, consulting is such a broad field, and there are you know you can easily ask a thousand questions. So I came up with an arbitrary uh, conceptual framework which I call spare. S-P-A-R-E, and I kind of use the word SPARE, an acronym, uh, so that I can hang my thoughts and ideas, so it's a vehicle. So it's not, it's not a magic formula, it's just a way of hanging things. And so the SPARE, the five letters in my vehicle SPARE are S for self-knowledge. In other words, if we want to be successful running an independent consulting practice or a small consulting practice, the, most, the first thing that I would talk about that I think you should think of, about, all of us should think about, is self-knowledge. You have to know yourself. You have to know what you're good at. You have to know what you can offer for which people are willing to pay. If people are not willing to pay you, you cannot be a consultant. It's like you can always call yourself the president of a company, but if you are the president of Broke Inc., you're still broke. <laughs> There's no point to have that vanity of being a CEO if you, have, you, if you have zero revenue. So hopefully, by dwelling on self-knowledge and giving you specific practical ideas on how you can start and run a consulting practice, I could help you and also continue to tell myself what I believe in because that's what I do over the past 29 years. The next word in the spare frame of mind is P. P stands for passion. It's not enough that you know what you are good at, what you can do specifically for which people will pay. You have to have passion in what you can do. 
Clients don't just pay us because we can do something. This is because much of sales, much of human communication is about emotion. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to admit it because the word emotion seems to convey or conjure up meanings of craziness, madness, irrationality. It doesn't have to be. But we are human beings. We have emotions. And we communicate with people emotionally. So if you cannot show your passion, if clients know that all you are giving me is your body, they're not happy with what you do. They are mesmerized by the fact that we not only know what we can do, what we are good at, that we do it like we are the task itself. It's like the best poet is the poem. The best singer is the song. The best consultant disappears in your client's eyes. You are part of your client. They don't need to know you. You're there. Let's move on to the third word. It's not enough you have self-knowledge about what you can do. It's not enough you have passion. It's very important for all of us who want to be consultants, who are successful, getting clients, getting paid, lasting year after year, making a decent living at least, if not becoming rich and famous. We have to take action. A stands for action. None of us who declare ourselves to be consultants want to be lazy. We are not lazy. The least thing we are willing to do is to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's what I mean by action. We have to be able, as one of you already sent me a question on how to find clients, how to find companies, <clears throat> organizations that hire you, you have to be able to sustain tedium. There is no mystery in finding paying clients other than the tedium of looking up databases, looking up company names, writing the right letter, sending them either by mail, hard copy letters, or email, or doing other things that I will mention later in order to make people know of you. This is action. You cannot sit home and watch TV and expect the phone to ring. You cannot stay in the kitchen and eat up everything in the refrigerator because you're depressed, because your phone is not ringing, nobody is paying you money, no matter how many thousands of letters that you send out, and you, don't, you can't even cry because you don't even know how to begin to cry. Never mind, continue to send letters, continue to call people, continue to go out and talk, continue to write a book, continue to write the article, continue to network, continue to all doing all these things. Go to church and pray. It's very effective. It always works. I'll give you a story later. So that's action. So it's not enough you have self-knowledge, you can show passion, that you are not afraid to take action all the time to sell yourself. It's very important for you and to, to, to all of us who really have to go through hell to make a living by calling ourselves a consultant. To finally come to the realization, R stands for realization, <laughs> that what we think as being logical, a client, it's logical for Joe Blow to hire me, it's logical for Mary Doe to hire me, it's logical that companies should have me, it's logical that the White House should hire you. What you think is logical doesn't count. <laughs> Because many things in real life are really not about logic as you think of it. The real logic 
is what you truly realize as you do your work. You truly realize real life experience will tell you what is truly logical. In short, many of the things that make a consultant successful are not obvious. They are not obvious, and I'm going to give you examples. So realization is to understand, to help yourself understand, to help all of us understand that we can always sit and daydream and think of an algorithm to find a million clients when in fact it's the day-to-day -day taking the action, seeing people and finding out what actually it at the end what makes a client tick? And what is that little thing that she or he wants? That's the time when you realize what you must do to get paid. Remember, there is no such thing as a consultant if he or she is not paid. <laughs> It's not enough you have self-knowledge, passion, taking action, realizing all the follies that you have been committing. And then finally, seeing the light is very important. By the time you are successful, you start your consulting work, you are very successful for a number of years, there will always be moment when somehow the universe seems to conspire against you, against us. The world has changed. Your skill that used to be so important, so attractive, so sexy, so appealing, you're so, so much in demand, suddenly you are old. You are passe. Nobody wants you anymore. You are like yesterday's fax machine. You are like the Underwood typewriter. You used to be sexy. Now you are just a piece of antique. <laughs> so the final word for the spare frame of mind is the word E for evolution. So in order to keep your consulting practice to go on and on forever, to be able to change as the world invariably will change, you have to constantly think of ways to evolve. You have to constantly think of morphing from being a worm into a butterfly. You have no choice. We don't have that choice. But if you truly like what you do, you find a way. So here is the framework. Let me go back to S. See, now all this, this is only a vehicle. It's just a, an arbitrary word that I came about to hang my ideas, because all these elements interact with one another. You know, you can't, they're not sausages, they're not all cut up. You can't compartmentalize them that discreetly. And so, so let me go back to S. Um, I was talking to my friend Rick Schilling, uh, one of the 40 men and women I interviewed to write the book Spare Room Tycoon 10 years ago. And Rick Schilling knows I'm here tonight talking to you. He said, James, you have to tell people. It's not, in, it's not enough that they think, oh, I've always wanted to be self-employed. I don't want to work for the man, or nowadays, for the woman. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm tired of it. Or that I don't want to be downsized too many times. Many people who want to become consultants, particularly they have worked for big government, Big industry, big nonprofits, they were downsized too many times. There can only be that many times you get downsized. <laughs> At some point in time, you're going to get out of bed and say, no more. <laughs> no more. And if you feel that you are at that moment, you are likely to be able to muster courage and determination. Much like in the mission of Gone with the Wind, with uh, Gone with the Wind, O'Hara, is that right? <laughs> oh, a scarlet. Scarlet would say, picking a piece of earth, no more. I am not going to starve again. 
you know, you have to make up your, your determination. Self-knowledge is that spot of time. We call it the spot of time. That moment when you tell yourself, I got it. It's your aha moment. It's the moment when you know, I, I want to do this. I want to call myself a consultant. So instead of talking in generalities, let me give you specific examples, mine and other people. You see, I, I started my business career working for a publishing company in New York. I lived in Astoria, Queens, and I took the double R train, the double R subway from Astoria, Queens, to Manhattan to work. And one day in this crowded subway, chum, 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 and I was reading the New York Times and very nonchalantly, I discovered an article, a short one, that says consulting as a viable way of making a living. And I, was, I read it, I thought it was interesting, I read it and I liked the idea and so I went to work and not thinking very much about it. Then some nine months later, a year later, my company decided to leave New York City to move to Orlando, Florida. And as part of the move, uh, the chairman wanted to lay off 75% of the employees. Luckily, I was the 25% who would be invited to go. But even though I got to go to Orlando for one week, every single day I was in conflict. I said to myself, James, should I continue to be a good corporate soldier? A Fortune 500 company job is a good job. My salary was a decent salary. It was great. Why should I say no? Why should I relinquish a very good career opportunity and not follow the company? But on the last day, at the last minute at night, I decided I didn't decide. I was very restless. I hopped, I left the hotel room. I was driving willy-nilly in the dark. Uh, and then I got out of the car by a restaurant, which had a tiny little light. And I was looking at the menu. And I had a most silly thought. I said, James. It would be nice to keep the Fortune 500 company job because I can afford an expensive meal at any time. I, I didn't have to be uh, that cheap or chintzy about going into good restaurants. And the moment I had that thought, I had a second thought. I had a counter thought. I immediately realized how silly and un-James Chan-like I was. <laughs> what? to do something that is against my will, against my wish, so that I have enough money to eat at a mediocre restaurant? No way. At that moment, the article in the New York Times about consulting as a viable way of living came back to me. And it was almost like enunciation. I saw the light. I got it. And you know why? why my personal enunciation was possible. This is about self-knowledge. You see, I got my PhD, I used to teach college, and, uh, and then I decided that even though I knew I was a good teacher, I really didn't want to teach. I wanted to be with people. I love people, in case you have not noticed. <laughs> I love your faces, all faces. I used to be a closeted extrovert. Now I'm just an extrovert. <laughs> I, can, I love to talk to fire hydrants. I talk to building in the middle of the night. So talking to people is the least I can do. But that's neither here nor there. So I worked for this company, and my job was to open the China market for the company's books and journals. We published very high-level scientific, technical, medical books and journals. And I never was in business. I never knew how to sell. I don't know why the Fortune 500 company wanted me. It was my luck. They liked me. 
they hire me. Uh, but of course, I was diligent. I work hard. I try to think of logical things as to how to promote books. And in the first 11 months, I got zero sales from China. You know, if you are a Fortune 500 company manager and you got zero sales in 11 months, do you know what your boss would do to you? Uh, but luckily, one day in the morning, my secretary gave me an envelope from China, from Beijing, from a, an import company located in Beijing. I pulled out of the envelope a prepayment check of 150,000 US dollars as prepayment, meaning I pay you first. You deposit the check into your bank. You meaning my company, not me. My company. <laughs> you deposit that check into your bank, and once you know the check is good, then you ship me the books and journals. And $150,000 at that time in 1982 would be equivalent to $334,000 in today's money. And that was the first of many checks to come. <laughs> So, you know, like, a, like an effective vampire, I smell blood. <laughs> like, really, there really is money to be made. It wasn't a pipe dream. China had money, did buy things. Even when it was poor as a country, this was like 30 years ago. So, so my awakening by the lamb at the restaurant in Orlando, in Florida, was partly bolstered by the fact that I had seen enough checks coming in. So, self-knowledge, right? I said, oh, see, okay, I might be taking a risk by quitting my job. But then, because I succeeded in selling, not just to China, I succeeded in getting orders from Singapore, from the Philippines, from Thailand, from South Korea, you know, so, so I, I really saw money. So what I did, was I quit, I went to Boyd's and used what little money I had at that time to buy the most good looking cashmere overcoat, overcoat I never owned. I bought a suit that was like, you drop dead, I'm beautiful, <laughs> you know. And that was all the money I had. Because it's very important, when you want to be a consultant, you have to be business-like, you have to look like you are a celebrity. Have you ever heard of Dress to Bill? The movie Dress to Kill? No, Dress to Bill. You must be nicely dressed to invoice people. It's not entirely a joke. But that's, even that's a distraction. That's not the point. The point then is uh, I, then I quit my job. I came to this library. You see, I came out of the publishing industry. And so in every industry, I'm showing you how to do it now. In every industry, whatever you do, there has to be a directory, like the Bible of your industry. And in the Bible of the publishing industry is the directory called Literary Marketplace, LMP. It's a book that weighs, like, weighs a ton. It's like illuminated manuscript, as heavy as one. So I came to this library. I s scanned all 1,000 publishing companies in the literary marketplace, one by one, because I succeeded in selling to China and Asia. So I kind of knew what publishing companies would buy my consulting services in the hope that I can help them sell more books and journals and databases and magnetic tapes and software, whatever. Right? So I very laboriously, remember the word tedious I was talking with you? Very tediously, but religiously. I boiled down 1,000 names into a list of 300 names. Names of the publishers, the presidents, or the CEO of companies, 300 companies that I thought I could help. Then I went home, I wrote a one-page letter, actually it was a two-page letter, with the help of a good writer friend. Writing promotional pieces requires special skills. You have to write like people will fall in love with you. <laughs> That's the idea. You can't just say, oh, I can help you. No, it doesn't work. You have to be evanescent, 
you have to be vivacious, you have to give people hope, and yet you still have to be honest. So I sent the 300 letters, and within 30 days, I got three paying clients, each of them paying me several thousand dollars to write marketing plans and this and that. That's how I got started. So end of one specific practical skill. It doesn't matter if you have never been a consultant before, but if you contemplate being one, you have to give yourself a test. You have to come to you have to come together, or come together. You have to come. You have to come up with a one-page letter, a short message, and send that message to targeted companies, organizations, government bureaucracies that you believe can use your services, and you launch that mailing. 30 years ago, we called that direct mail marketing. I'll write to a specific person, and it has to be personalized. And nowadays, even though a lot of people are used to sending email messages, make sure that the email messages are sent personalized. Nobody wants to read unsolicited email that is not addressed to them. That's self-knowledge. That's a start. Let's move on to passion. I have many passion stories to tell, but I cannot, I cannot help telling you this story of mine that made me what I am today. I was an illegal immigrant for five years. I came to this country from Hong Kong. I went to the University of Chicago. I got my master's degree. I got my PhD. I started teaching. And because I came as a student, my student visa expired. And by law, the law was correct. And that was the law. Once you finish your study, you have to go home. But by then, I decided that I wanted to stay. I wanted to be myself. I wanted the autonomy and the freedom that this crazy America could give me, because <laughs> I'm also crazy. It took me five years, three different lawyers, and sustaining several deportation hearings. Well, they had to deport me, and they should. So, and. So in five years, I could not work. I could not make money. I had to borrow money from my uncle, from my PhD dissertation advisor, who is still alive and well. He's 92 years old, Professor Rhodes Murphy in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I just drove and saw him the other day, uh, several months ago. He loaned me money. A friend of mine gave me food, lodging, emotional support, which is the most important thing. But then I mailed so many letters out to Fortune 500 companies, they hired me. Mobile Oil wanted me. Continental Grain wanted me to turn me into a merchandiser. I had no idea what a merchandiser was. Uh, Cabot Corporation in Boston wanted to train me to become a manager of metals analysis. I had no clue what <laughs> metal. Uh, Chemical Bank wanted to train me as a banker. I had no idea how to become a banker. But doesn't matter. They offered me jobs, but there was a catch. At the end of the interviewing process, no human resources manager would hire me because I was an illegal person. Mm. Yeah, I could not work, and I had no, no green card, the whole nine yards. So. And so, and I told you that I hired three lawyers. The first two only wanted my money and never wanted to help me. The first one wanted, uh, told me, oh, you, you are just, you are bad because you shouldn't have gotten your PhD. You should be a glass blower. If you blow real hard, you know, we America needs blowers, you know. If you were a blower, I could get you a green card real easy. You know, one of those things. Uh, but that's a, a uh, digression. So I was very depressed, and I actually was about to throw in the tower and return to Hong Kong because I exhausted almost, almost exhausted my ability to sustain this five-year-long immigration battle. And I was 
so anxious, I was walking around in this neighborhood, and then I saw my chance. There was a cathedral. I said, oh, talk to God. <laughs> so I walked in. No, I, I wasn't Christian. I'm still not Christian, but hey, you know, it was an opportunity. <laughs> It pays, it pays to be silly uh, or totally clueless. So I walked into the cathedral, I, in, I'm on my knees, and I started praying to St. John Newman, and then of course talking to God. I had no idea, I just talked to anybody. And, and then at that moment I said to myself, okay, since I'm losing steam, I have to come up with something in order to give myself a reason why I still want to be in America. Like James, it's not like you don't have degrees. I mean, you have, you have degrees up to whatever. And I'm not going to starve to death in Hong Kong anywhere. Mm -hmm. so, so I said, I, I am on that day, at that moment, my spot of time is, I'm on my knees, I'm talking to God, and I, I said, God, if you can help me get a green card, which is a piece of paper, it's not even green, <laughs> that allows you to work in America. I will help pull China and America closer. It was that moment that I just splurted out these words. So I made a vow. And you know, it's so very interesting because once I said that, and then I said, well, you know, if God can't help me, then fine. Then there's, not, you know, there's nothing, you know, not something I can do. I've done all I can. So somehow there was a tremendous sense of peace mm -hmm. and quiet. It's just, just so, oh, I've done it, you know. <laughs> what more do I need to do? So I went home, went to my friend's apartment, continued to use the typewriter to crank out more letters. And a friend of mine loaned me a Wang word processor for those of you who are old enough. <laughs> To know of the WAN word processor, you know, you type a letter, you push a button, and then you put 500 letters in the bin, and then you crank out 500 personalized letters. I sent them out. A CEO of the company that I later worked with returned to New York, and he saw my letter on his desk. My letter basically said, I can help you open China. And when he was in China, he couldn't get along with the Chinese. They put him in a flea bag, he didn't eat the right food, and oh, they bitch and mong to each other. Oh, see, East and West part of company, big time. So maybe God was helping. That maybe as he was flying in mid-air at 36,000 feet, maybe God told him, look, you have to have somebody to help you. So my letter sh showed up and I was hired. And I had to prove, with the help of my company, that I was the only person in America who could do a job that no other American citizen could do. I did it. <coughs> did it. That was 1982. So why am I dwelling on this? Passion. Passion. Did I, at that moment of tremendous weakness, insecurity, near despair, would I lie to myself, forget the fact that I can't even prove if God exists, but would I lie to myself to warn myself to do something I hated to do? Of course not. That's what I mean by passion. You have. Somehow, actually, the story is also related to a matter of adversity. I think adversity, when you are down and out, when you have no money, when you have no country, actually, of course, it's painful. It's awful. It's terrible. And it goes on and on like you're always in hell. You're in a tunnel. It's always dark. You cannot see the light. It's very painful. But when you are in hell, after a while, as long as you keep relatively sane, and don't go crazy, don't walk off the cliff, somehow the spot of time will come to you. It's in the darkest moment that you know what you want to do. In my darkest moment, I discover what I could do. 
Let's move on because it's not enough that you discover what you want to do. You have to actually get people to pay you, don't you? <laughs> Even God doesn't pay you. You have to prove it, <laughs> right? You can't say, "Oh God, please give me money." It doesn't work. I don't think it does. You can say, "Please God, help me," but you know, no money. You, you do it. So let's show. It makes sense. So, so let's move to action. So in order to get people to pay us as consultants, you, we have to find a way to sell ourselves. Being a consultant, and the more successful we are as consultants, the more effective and successful we should train ourselves to be, to sell, sell and sell and sell. But selling is very tough. Nobody wants to sell. Because selling implies you're begging, or at least you feel that way. You're asking people for money. It's not that elegant asking people for money, don't you think? Right? And also, selling means you have to convince people. Most of them don't even want to pay you. You have to cajole. You have to uh, reason. You have to argue. You have to negotiate. You have to justify. You have to verify. I mean, after a while, it's really a pain in the big royal behind selling. And not only that, I used to, I used to tell myself and people, oh, you know, in order to uh, mitigate, ameliorate, reduce the pain and suffering of selling to strangers, you try to tell yourself, oh. No, I'm not selling myself. I'm just selling my expertise, my knowledge, my experience, my sleight of hand, my craftsmanship, my algorithm. Forget it. <laughs> you are, but in the end, you are selling yourself. You are selling your personality. You're selling your character. You are selling your own personal consistency. You are selling your quirks. So, action is very important that we have day in and day out a, a way to discipline ourselves to do a number of things. Whether it will be this is now talking about marketing yourself. I mean, there are so many ways to market yourself. Uh, you write a book. You write an article. Uh, you go and turn it yourself into a public speaker. By the way, if you want to be A consultant, you have to learn how to talk to fry hydrants. You have to learn how to kiss frogs, keep kissing, and some frogs are dead frogs; they don't even smell good. <laughs> and and but you have to keep kissing until you find the princess or the prince. They turn into a paying client. I'm talking metaphorically, of course. <laughs> so you uh, do your website. You print your business card. You make sure that you create matching letterhead, stationery, so you look businesslike. It's very important to be businesslike. You don't have to be. One of you ask me, is it costly to be a consultant? No, it costs you base practically nothing to become a consultant. You can get up tomorrow and tell the world, I am a consultant. That's not the issue. The issue is to. Be businesslike. You can work from home. You don't have to rent an office. There are organizations, incubators, companies that will rent you space, give you people who answer your phone to give you a measure of corporateness, that you look like you're the real CEO. You know, you're running a trillion-dollar company. But let me tell you, clients don't pay us. Because we have a BMW car, clients don't pay, don't pay us because we own one Liberty Place. Clients pay us because we have something very specific that he or she wants. As long as you are dressed properly, respectfully, your car your car is at least clean. You have, even if you live in a studio apartment, just have one corner of your studio designated as your office. If you are running, if you are in the bathroom, do not answer the phone. <laughs> Finish your bathroom activity. 
let people leave a messages. You don't want them to hear the sound of running water. <laughs> if your dishwasher or your washer washing machine is running, don't answer the phone. Chances are it's a telemarketer, not a paying client. So don't be so anxious. But you have to be businesslike. So to continue, how to promote yourself? Then you have to join an association. One people I interview, the 40 men and women I interview, has a nice skill. In order to expose yourself to a lot of people in your industry, you join the right association. And it's not just joining. You volunteer to be one of their official members, which means you are investing a lot of your time and energy. You may, be, you may become a membership uh, director, no pay. You may become a, uh, 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 a newsletter uh, writer and editor, no pay, it's pro bono work. Uh, but then again, you know, in the course of putting in years of effort, your name is always mentioned. It has to be the right industry. Another, action, another point about action I want to emphasize. It's not enough for you to know what you are good at. You, in order for, for all of us to be able to get paying clients who pay, me, who pay us adequately, we must be, we cannot be a generalist. We can be generalist as a base in terms of we're knowledgeable about a, a, a broad topic, but we have to specialize, specialize, and specialize. In other words, you cannot say, oh, I'm selling my service as a writer. No, it's too broad. Nobody is going to pay you as a writer. Then you have to specialize. Oh, I'm a spy novel writer. Now you begin to specialize. Then even within spy novel, you can say, I specialize in writing legal spy novels. So you begin to go down and deep and deep and deep. Uh, some of you, you are a, an engineer. So I have a friend who is a very successful consultant. And we have a skill we call the three-word drill. I actually created the three-word drill. A three-word drill is if you can summarize what you do in three words, just three words, you are allowed the time of saying three words before people lose interest in you. So you have to pick the words, very specific words, that you know the right potential client, when the right potential client hears it, he or she knows, ah, you're the one I want. Example, one, this friend of mine, one of his key words is hydrocarbons. He's an engineer. He's not selling himself just as an electrical engineer, or mechanical engineer, or civil engineer. He's a hydrocarbons. And even within hydrocarbons, I'm sure he has a word that is even more deeper than that. Did I hammer this idea real deep? This is like dental work, deep cleaning here, drilling all the way down. Because if you just sell yourself, oh, I can help you write a resume. What? It's like I tell my client I can speak Chinese. What? 1.3 billion people can speak Chinese. <laughs> So, action requires that you are able, in the course of doing your work, marketing yourself, seeing clients, kissing frogs. Kissing frog meaning a lot of people pick our brains. Oh yeah, I have done, oh yeah, my brain's been picked so many times. I can quote two examples. One example. One day, remember my boys over cashmere overcoat. Oh, I love it. It somehow I grew bigger and it shrank. I couldn't. I had to throw it away. Oh, it was a lot of money. Uh, made me look like a prince. I, I was. I was so vain. And and uh, and uh, oh, oh, oh. So I put on my boys overcoat and my boys suit and my black leather shoes, black color socks. I mean, I know the. I know the tricks. And I drove from Santa City to northern New Jersey to a company whom I thought would be my potential client. So I was showing up, I was like I was, you know, like a, an opera singer to be on stage. I got to that place, 
I opened my car door. You know what my pot potential client was? He was running. His, whatever he was doing, he had like a derelict, uh, kind of like broken uh, truck. He was living inside the truck. I looked at him. He looked at me. I said to myself, oh, James, uh, go home. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent the whole day. So that's one frog. That's a frog. I used to call these people sunfish. You know, you go fishing, you're in a pond, and you put in your lines, and there's little sunfish, and you cannot eat them. So. And then the other one, what is, more, more, what is worse about kissing the wrong frog is you spend your money and time and your effort and your energy, and then you have your brain sucked by these people, and they never told you that they would never use you in a million years. Particularly if your so-called potential client is not a decision maker, yeah. she is not the CEO, he is not the president, that he or she, no offense to rank and file manager, She's only a manager. She's only a, 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 you know, a staff person. No offense. But they have work that they want to do. They are more willing, more than willing, to pick your brain as a consultant to help them do their work. With me? I'm not blaming them, but hey, you're willing. So my other example of really hurtful brain picking was there was this publishing company in New York and the director of marketing expressed interest in using my services. So I put on my boy's overcoat, my black color suit, and I got up at four o'clock in the morning. I took the Amtrak train. Uh, I went to see him. Uh, of course, I knew that he would not pay me uh, on that day for that day's work. And he wanted me to write a proposal, so I came home. I wrote a proposal using several days' time to tell him how I could help his company market to China. So two weeks later, I follow up. He said, oh, I want to talk more. Would you come back again? So I went back again, talk more, nothing happened. I go through this all the time. It's very painful. It's very painful. But we just have to do it. <laughs> and you know what? We get better in smelling out. <laughs> Whether or not there's a smell. You can smell if a client is sincere and serious. Just to give you a quick, very specific thing. If I smell a client is serious, I will say, pay me so many dollars just to see me on the first day even for an exploratory session so that you can pick my brain no matter, just like eating a buffet. Eat me, eat, <laughs> but you have to pay. <laughs> and if they say yes, chances are those clients can continue to give you more work. And other specific example of, on how to avoid those bad frogs Companies who are sincere, people who are sincere and who are decision makers, when they talk to you on the phone the first time, they don't hide behind technology. They tell you their real name. They give you their complete information. They start telling you their problems in simple words. No metaphors, no nuances, no, no similes, no figures of speech, no hiding. They just tell you what is hurting. And finally, there is a tone of intimacy. It's that tone of intimacy that allows you to decipher if a potential client is going to abuse you or going to use you. Let's move on from action. So I've done self-knowledge. I've done passion. I've done action. Let's move on to realization. And here comes the most important piece of realization that many people who have never done consulting, and even for people who have done consulting for many years, never get. They never understand. It took me 15 years, finally, to understand how, to, how much to charge and how 
to charge. You see, I'm sure that you can write lots of PhD dissertations on how to price your consulting services. I, am, I have no time to write any more PhD dissertations, <laughs> nor do I want to bore myself and bore you. <laughs> but there is a rule of thumb, very simple way. When I first started out in 1983, I bought a book that tells me how to charge, and it's really quite simple. You see, any, all of us have worked in the past. <coughs> So we got a salary. And if right now, if you want to do this exercise, very simple, it's only take 10 seconds. If you write down the salary that you have ever had that is okay by you, you divide that salary by 2,000. In other words, if you made at one point in your life $100,000, that was your salary, you divide $100,000 by 2,000 hours. In other words, 100 divided by 2. So it gives you an hourly rate of $50. Now, what most consultants fail to understand, when you become a consultant, you cannot afford and you must not hold on to an employee mindset. Let me tell you what I mean by an employee mindset. An employee is somebody who goes to work and his or her employer promises that they will be hired day in, day out, 365 days, right? That work is guaranteed you. You are like a chicken in a farm, on a farm. They will feed you until they kill you. Uh, <laughs> So, and the 2,000 hours come out of, there are 52 weeks a year, you give yourself two weeks vacation, so you have 50 weeks, and there are 40 hours a week, because there are eight days, eight hours a day, and five working days, 40, 40 times uh, uh, 50 weeks, so you get the 2,000. So here comes realization. You will be extremely, lucky if you are able to bill, to invoice as much as one-third of your hours in a year. In other words, you should base on your rate with the realistic, painful fact if you can for all of us who are beginning in consulting, most of us can only charge on an hourly basis. If you can bill 666.6666 hours, you're very lucky. In fact, I want to be more conservative and I want it to be even simpler in helping you how to calculate your hours. 600, just use the number 600. No matter how much you want to charge, if you want to charge $20 an hour, do you know how much you make a year? Can somebody, somebody gives me. If you charge only $20 an hour and you get only 600 hours a year of pay, how much will you have made in one year? Please. $12, right, do you think you can live on $12,000? You can't even pay your doctor. <laughs> you can't even pay Blue Cross Blue Shield for $12,000. So, that's realization. Uh, <clears throat> let's move on to something else. Because uh, uh, I can go on with some more stories and uh, I do have one more story, but maybe I should go into evolution. So, <coughs> Uh, can I talk about one specific example of realization that is as, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. You know, realization has to do, earlier I made a big song and dance about the fact that you logically think that you are doing the right thing, that you should therefore, the client should use you, and you are good, you're the biggest and best 
expert ever on earth under the sun since the birth of time. <laughs> Nobody wants it. One of those, one of those things would be, okay. Uh, sometimes s some people will say, "Oh, you know, a company calls, a company calls, a potential client calls, and uh, the voice on the phone is saying, "Oh, why don't you come over and uh, you know give a presentation?" Now, a, a, a very logical consulting question is, should I charge for the exploratory session? Because many of us, particularly when we are beginners, we do not dare charge. In fact, when somebody is just waving a carrot in front of us, we we'll say, <laughs> you know, we would jump up and down and like we could, we'll give our, them our bodies, our soul, and do things for free in the hope that we get business. It may not be wrong, but you know, sometimes if you run into a company, a potential client that has the seriousness in the tone of voice, the way he handles the situation tells you what uh, is his or her problem, it is okay to set a fee. You can say, I will charge a standard, and then you come up with a sum of money for half a day. Be courageous. One thing, one realization fact I have learned. Clients who really want us, pay us. In the end, money is not the object. This is my experience in 29 years. People who are not, who are, who are not willing to pay, they will always find a reason to argue with you, to bargain with you. Those are difficult clients and some of them are even toxic. I call them the toxic clients. So, have confidence. When the right moment comes, ask to be paid. And there's one tiny little factoid about realization, about paying, asking to be paid, if people pay, they pay attention. People who don't pay you, don't value you. People who pay, that means they really want to know. They are paying attention, they are focusing. Of course you have to know what you're doing. That goes without saying. So have I hammered these ideas? In the end, what most of us Sometimes myself included, myself included. Suddenly, when we need confidence the most, we lose it. Losing confidence is the worst <coughs> psychological thing you can do to yourself. I one time was on the dental chair and the Dentists was doing like, you know, dentists are kind of, you know, I'm not surprised if they are all s &M people. But I said, <laughs> I said, oh, I'm, I'm nervous. No, Mr. Dr. Dan dentist, I'm nervous. My dentist said, I am not. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear my dentist that he was not nervous. Imagine if my dentist was nervous too. Oh my God, you know. Am I making a point across? But it's easier said than done. There's another factoid about realization. Many of us complain, oh, I'm only a one person, one man, one woman consultant. Oh, you know, my potential client may think that I'm working out of a studio apartment in the academy house, and oh, you know, they are a multi-billion dollar company, they'll never warn me. That may be true, that may be the case. You cannot stop people from being prejudicial. There is just absolutely no way. And you are not, I am not going to please everybody. It's not possible, it's not advisable, it's the wrong thing to do. Actually, if you do your work sincerely, conscientiously, sedulously, like a good craftsman, 
like you work at it and you work at it and you persevere and you work at it, you publish enough paper, you give enough public presentations, you go to enough meetings, you, you see, you kiss enough frogs, you, 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 you try to prove to the world that you really know what you, you care about your subject matter. Some big companies will find us. In fact, it just happened to me recently, an extremely gigantic global company call me. And when the, first, when the person first picked, uh, was on the phone, I thought he was a telemarketer. I was about to hang up. I mean, he identified himself. He said, I'm so-and-so corporation, and we have a situation where we want you to come in as a consultant. Uh, and we are considering other big consulting firms. I said, how did you find me? He couldn't, he didn't say, he didn't know. He said, you are very difficult to find. It, as he said, I, it, it took me two days to find you. Uh, probably in some kind of a Yahoo site, I had no idea. I have never done anything in Yahoo, so I don't know why he <laughs> Yahoo me. But, but then what is the most important thing is he told me, uh, they, they hired me, uh, I gave them a price, which I like, they pay, they like my work. And after everything was done, they were happy with the work, I went to this person on the phone, I said, why, why did you hire me, why did you want me? You have so many big consulting firms doing China. Why me? And you are such an enormous company. They are so enormous. They just, the, 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 technologically, they are still number one. And you know what he said to me? He said, James, I want you because uh, the big consulting firms <coughs> charge us a lot of money. And once they get the work, they farm the work out to fresh graduates from name brand schools who give us cookie cutter solutions. <laughs> so it's about realization. I'm talking about realization. What I really want to tell you and to tell myself to have self-esteem. There is only one person who can give you your own self-esteem. You. Your wife will not give it to you. Your boyfriend will not give it to you. Even God will not give it to you. You have to give it to yourself first. Let's move on to the last thing, evolution. No matter how successful we are, being a consultant, we have to keep changing because the world is changing. We have to come up with new ways to um, do things in maybe in a new fashion or come up with new services. And I have a good example of what I mean by evolution. And I like Rick, Rick Schilling, my friend, so much that I'm going to talk about his story because it's very educational. See, Rick Schilling, Rick Schilling was a banker for some 25 years or so. He worked for many banks uh, in the Philadelphia region. And of course, one bank after another either folded or they sold to one another and then he got downsized once, twice, three times and Rick was so tired of being downsized. He finally said to himself, no, I'm not going to be a corporate employee anymore. Plus, you know, I'm in my 50s. This is not going to work anymore. I'm not a teenager, I'm not 25, I'm not 32. And so he started uh, his business trying to sell his banking expertise to small and mid-sized companies and to coach them, to consult with them on how to get loans from banks. Isn't it logical? Remember logical? He thought that was logical, right? I mean, you were a banker for 25 years, for God's sake. You, you, deal, you dealt with loans. You dealt with small and mid-sized companies coming you for loans. You know the entire procedure. The, the, the six tons of files that you have to come up and they have to sign in order to get money from you, right? So, so that's your expertise. And it's a particular type of loan portfolio. It's not just any loan. You know, must be a certain type of commercial loan. I don't know. I don't need to know. So one day, uh, Rick Schilling was talking to a potential client at a big bank, a manager who is a decision maker, not just a rank and file person tried to pick his brain. And in fact, the person even know him. I mean, they were friends for a lot of years. And after Rick was doing his song and dance and, and he thought that he could 
you know, just he convinced, he was unable to convince the potential client anymore. The potential client said to him, Rick, I like you very much as a person, but I don't need you. I have no use for your service. To all of us, when somebody has the courage and the honesty to say to our face, I don't need you, honey. <laughs> Most people would get cankerous, quarrelsome, started to fight, right? What can I do to get business from you? Or do, do or say all kinds of things. Rick did something extremely smart. Do you know what he did that was very smart? Hmm? Keep going. Keep going. No, he didn't do it, huh? Here's the answer, and real answer. He said nothing. It's called the skill of silence. Complete total silence. You know, when someone has the courage and the honesty to tell you, I don't need you, sometimes, those people, after they have rejected us, will then tell us what they really need on their own. Okay. Yeah. On their own accord. Listen, we should learn how to shut up. I know it's silly. Consultants, the most important skill of a consultant is not to talk. I know I'm talking, in the, but it really, and it happened to me too. So at that moment, the potential client said to Rick, no, I don't need whatever you offer. But you know, I have a, I have a high level banker who is going to be on maternity leave. And she is very important. If I lose her, I don't know what to do. And at that moment, like every good entrepreneur, every good consultant, every good independent contractor, any person who th can think fast on her or his feet, he said, knowing that, first of all, Rick already has a database of 300 bankers in his computer. So he knows what these people do. And the moment the potential client said, I want a banker who can do this type of commercial loan, he knows at least three persons in his database who can do the job. So instead of Rick Schilling at that very nanosecond telling the client, trying to sell a client on what he knows, a new business evolution has come to him at that very moment, that spark of time. There was a realization that leads to evolution. Rick says to himself, why do I try so hard to sell myself if I can sell other people? So he said to the client, okay, you have a budget? Yes. How much money can you afford? Well, the person gave him the budget. Oh, wow, a lot of money. <laughs> and, okay. I have three candidates for you, right? I will make sure that the candidates, I know these people, I, I know what they do, what they can do. I will introduce them to you. They work for you as a temporary employee, a, a, an interim banker. So it's full time, but I will take a cut. And Rick was straightforward. My cut would be so much of a percentage. The potential client said, fine. From that moment on, Rick had a new business, evolution. The lesson of the story, this, 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 you only understand what you must offer the world by being with the world, by being in the world. You don't know what people's minds are until you are with them, until you sleep with them in their mind, parallel, talking and sometimes shutting up. And on the point of shutting up, I'm going to shut up. And that would be spare. Self-knowledge, passion, action, realization, and evolution. Thank you very much.